Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and of course, a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. This is Elizabeth Townsend Gard. I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School, and I just want a quilt. So today we talk to Jeff Kaplan of Craft Optics. Jeff is um, amazing, um, and he is um, the genius behind Craft Optics, along with his dad. And we talked to him about um, these amazing glasses. He is also our December uh, sponsor, and he sent us a pair so we could play with them and experience them in the clubhouse. Okay, my name is Jeff Kaplan. I'm calling from Craft Optics. Awesome. And we're in Madison, Wisconsin. Oh, awesome. So you're a bit chilly right now, I would imagine. Yeah, that's why I'm wearing this. Yeah, we're cold too, but we're at like the 40s. So it's Yeah, ridiculous. I know. Cold for you is like... <laughs> Pathetic. Yeah. It's getting worse every year. <laughs> yeah. um, so tell me your first memory, if you have one, of someone sewing or quilting in your life. Sewing and quilting in my life? Yeah. Uh, you know, it, we really didn't have... I have to say, we didn't have anybody doing that in my family. <laughs> Nobody. My, my grandmother's... My grandmother knitted and that was that, that was, was it that was so it. tell us how you ended up going to many quilt shows and being part of this quilting community with these most amazing glasses which i'm wearing and we're going to talk more about soon um they're amazing you know i have to tell you the best part of the glasses i mean they're great so i've been wearing them and and like doing all kinds of things but on your website it talks about like how you can like so and then look at this part of it, like mm-hmm. the top part to watch TV, which yeah. I don't usually do because my, my regular reading glasses, you they're, can't do that full, really, yeah, right? right? And so it really is true. It was amazing. I was like, okay, I just want to like watch TV and hand sew because sure. this is like yeah. the perfect, they're perfect. They're, and just yeah. the way you like, it's like you like sat a long time and figured out exactly how it would work because it's remarkable. It really is. There's a lot of time. Yeah, there was a lot of time and effort. But by the way, the light is on incorrectly on your. The light side. is on incorrectly. <laughs> All right. That's why it's off to the side. It's off to so the you'll, side. So you'll be a lot brighter if you if. I'll show you. I'll show you how to okay, put it on. Okay. Cool. Uh, okay. Cool. Awesome. But um, but yeah, a lot of thought went into it. In fact, um, you know, our, I think we we talked about this before. You yeah. Knew that, that the here you want to see how to do it yeah tell me how you do it okay it's real common and it's we even the- so jeff we even like last night went for ice cream late at night so we could see like could i quilt in the car while it was dark and sure. like was the light too bright or not too bright so it turned out like the second there's two two things like a bright one and a less bright one and if you uh-huh. sit in the back seat with the less bright one you totally can drive around and quilt while it's night we've had so. not while you're driving no, no, no. Husband driving, kid in the front seat. Yes, exactly. We hear this a lot. That's it's, it's actually very common. That's so great. Um, here, I'll show you. So the light, okay. so the light goes. The wire is on the top. Yeah. Okay. Now, what you're doing with the light is this. You are attaching it up here, so it's moving around. Can you see yeah. that? Yeah. It doesn't oh. go there. It goes right down below it. So it snaps onto that bar. Oh, it snaps on the bar. Okay. Yeah. Totally. Put the light down. That's perfect. There. Okay. So okay. glad you, so so, glad you so came. It's not going to move. It, yeah. it won't move once it's in its right spot. Uh, well, this is so cool. This is amazing. Okay, okay cool. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so, um, all right, so, so tell you, me. You this about quilters, yeah. Yeah, so tell yeah. me the story. I know the story, but let's start from the beginning um, sure. of the story of craft, op- craft optics. How did this begin? Sure. Um, our background is in the in the dental market in fact someone on your um on your site was asking some questions about that this morning that i was just answering before we started oh that's great uh, the conversation here um uh the company was uh, we we founded a company um uh in the early 1980s called craft uh, called oroscoptic which is was the first company in the dental world to market this kind of product to general dentistry there were some specialty items and there was some, there was a product uh, out there for the surgical market, but not in dentistry. And it started because my father, who was a dentist, um, had terrible back pain from sitting hunched over, uh-huh. you know, eight hours a day doing work. And so, and that was um, starting to threaten his career. He took a look at uh, various ways that he could get into a better posture. And this is way before people were really talking about ergonomics and, and those kinds of things. So uh, he was pretty uh, 
dentists at that time sat on these little stools that had a belly bar, and you'd lean over that bar. You kind of just lean on this bar. And they didn't and have the, they didn't have glasses at all. Like this is like before wore glasses. They wore glasses, but they weren't wearing telescopic magnification. So interesting. So the way what what would happen is people would say, "Oh, I can't see, and I'm having trouble seeing." And what happens then is the optometrist would give them a prescription for a stronger reading correction. Yeah. What happens with a single lens is the stronger that reading correction is, the shorter the focal distance. So if someone couldn't see, they'd have to they'd start, you know, adding a reader over a reader, or they get really strong ears and they'd have to lean over, you know, really close to the patients. Yeah. And so uh, that just, you know, didn't promote decent posture at all. Yeah. So he looked around and found some uh, some versions like this and. Uh, existing i think they were out of germany initially optics there were some specialty units for some other um arena uh -huh. and adopted them for dentistry and then uh and started making these. he's made them for himself and then he found he could now sit up right in a nice comfortable posture and still see better than he could see when he's leaning over right into the that's patient. amazing yeah. now i'm the, i'm looking at that that they worried about. So you didn't, you wanted to be further away. You couldn't. You don't want to be close to a surgical site. So. Right, right. Um, and so, did you uh, pursue patents or like how did you get involved? So he he invents it. He thinks that this is what he needs. He that you start to think about this. So what's the next step in the oroscopic life? Well, back then, uh, yeah, he we went through several design iterations until we came upon the one that um, where where we designed it ourselves. Or he designed it himself along with some pretty talented optical engineers who happen to be the same guys that, you know, that put together craft optics. Um, and they did patent that and, uh, they patent the optics back then. Um, and then, you know, after, uh, once you were able to sit upright in a nice comfortable, uh, position, you realize that the light, you know, when you're that far away, then you, then light becomes an issue. And so they're always, you know, if you, if you've been to the dentist, you know, they're always adjusting this overhead light while they're working. Right. And so having the light, he came up with the idea of having the light right between his eyes, which means he wouldn't have to adjust the light. So when you have this, right. you know, you put this thing on, and all of a sudden you're able to, you know, everything you see is lit. You never right. have to think yeah. about your light. Right. So that's where that came from. Initially, we had them on, he on headbands, and then we eventually made them small enough as technology improved to connect them to, um, uh, you know, right onto the glasses. So interesting. And so that was patented as well. And a lot of that is, has to do with lens technology. So you're patenting the design of the lens and what the lens does is focus the light, get, gets rid of shadows and it gives you a certain, helps you get a certain intensity and so forth. Yeah, it's, so, it's remarkable. It gives you the space to work that is yeah. really defined. It, it's the space to work is exactly right. That's what it does. And it gives you space to work without having to, you can really work without futzing around with lights and yeah. All these other things that tend to get in the way of your concentration. And, and without light. So, you know, as yeah. the as the light went down in the bedroom last night, I didn't have to turn the light on in the right. car last night. Like yep. you have your own little space of working, which is actually kind of amazing too because it may, it gives you like this little zone of meanness that is you're, kind you're of – your own world, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's it's exactly, pretty awesome. That's exactly right. For creative people, that's that's where they want to stay. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, so yeah. or so Scott – Oroscoptic. So tell me more yeah. what happened to that company because I think you – did you sell that company or sort of what happened yeah. to that company? Yeah. So the company, uh, it grew – so, you know, at the time, dentists weren't wearing these kinds of products at all. And yeah. And we did a lot of trade shows. I went with my dad. I mean, years and years of going to shows and um, people walking right by and not paying any attention. Yeah. And laughing, saying, oh, I'll get those when I'm old. Ah, ha, ha. Right. And a few people who were professors and lecturers um, tried them, and they went nuts, and they loved them, and they realized this is a huge thing, and they started talking about them. And so late mm -hmm. 80s, the company kind of took off. It was a long time of, of hard work, and then it, it finally you know, started taking off. It grew pretty rapidly. And so we, um, uh, we, we did sell that at the end of 1996. Amazing. Uh, so throughout that whole period of time, though, uh, patients of our dentist customers used to call us and say, hey, I'm, I, I'm a quilter. Uh, I do embroidery. I do needlepoint. I, right. 
Oh, my dentist is wearing these cool glasses. I want some of those. What we had was not really consumer friendly. And one of the questions actually on, on your uh, on the, the Facebook page this morning was someone recognized that their dental hygienist had, you know, similar glasses. Yeah. So our whole set is about half the price of what. Interesting. You know, um, so we just didn't have a product for him, but we kept getting enough calls that it made us think about the possibility of maybe someday after, you know, post or doing something um, yeah. to address just the needs of artists. And that's, and that's what we wound up doing. We, had to come up with the design first. And, uh, and, and so you can't just take a surgical or dental product and apply it to what quilters need or what. So why, and I'm curious why that is. Like what is different about the the activities of a dentist or a doctor than that isn't true with a craft person? You know, it's, it's not, it, a lot of the ergonomics are similar. Mm-hmm. Um, well, obviously cost is one. Yeah. Uh, Weight is another, um, but there are also some some uh, funny things that we discovered in our uh, in our research very early on when we had a um, had a prototype. And I went to a an, I don't know if I told you the story before, but I went to a uh, it was a knitting um, shop here in Madison, and I went to a, I was sitting there working, and I had a prototype with me, and there was a group of women sitting around. It was a knitting group that got together once or twice a week at this coffee shop. And there was a table, I think there were about eight of them. There was one chair open at the table. So I, I went over and I said, hey guys, can I show you this thing? Let me get your opinion on what you think. And it was a range of ages. It was probably 40 to, I think the oldest woman was close to 80. She was in the late 70s. And so I, I had this, you know, had a set of glasses and I, I passed them around and everyone tried them on. Oh, these yeah. are cool. This is neat. And I explained, you know, that trying them on, if they, they wore glasses, I showed them the how to, you know, hold these in front of your own glasses so you can right. see what. And um, when uh, it came to the last person, she tried them on and she said, well, these are, these are really great, but how am I supposed to drink my coffee? And I said, well, you know, can't you just flip these up, to flip the telescopes up? And the way this was designed before uh-huh. from the little version, the hinge we had, you flip it up, but the cup, a cup would, would hit. <laughs> How am I supposed to drink? I get it. Because there's like a space, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> and so, it's the weirdest thing. Right. I thought, you know, you never worry about a dent, you know, so no. Right. You it. Dentists so, aren't going to drink coffee while they're. Yeah, how many surgeons are having a coffee while they're, right. you know, while they're in surgery? A dentist. Yeah. And so, we just never thought of that. And, and I so love we that. So that someone can eat because she said, I'm not going to take this glasses off, this set of glasses back on. All right. So, so you have to have it all the way up. Yeah. So well, I mean, and things. you can wear them all the way up. I was wearing them yesterday yeah. so that you could just, you can have them on all the time. You know, like it's kind of remarkable. <laughs> In Houston, you know, we, we wear them around our necks at the shows. Uh-huh. So I had, you know, I had it around my neck like this and, I'm, and we were, you know, all day busy, 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 talking all day long. And we left the show exhausted and we're walking out and we stopped at the restaurant in our hotel and we're ordering food. And, and I, I looked down, I realized, Oh, both of us, my wife and I were wearing our, <laughs> that's off. really great. Well, you can definitely use them. The one part. So my experience so far, so I totally, totally love them and I can't wait for other people to experience it. Cause I really do feel like, um, I did on the pre-roll for that. Um, I feel 12 again, like not just that I can see like a 12 year old, I feel like a 12 year old. Like and when I was 12 and I was cross stitching and I was doing crafts, I just felt like I could do anything. And yeah. I felt the freedom of 12. Um, and that's sort of, it's not just like you can see better. It's that you have the confidence to do whatever you want to do. That's kind of the way I feel when I put them on. And it's a feeling that doesn't go away. I told you that like I tried them on last year and I was like, okay, I just like dreamt about them because yeah. they were like amazing. And obviously there's a lot of uh, other IP that we need to talk about. Um, yeah. what, where am I going with this? Oh, so yeah, so the 12 thing. So I think that it's just remarkable. Um, it's a common comment. I mean, yeah. we, hear that, we hear that quite a bit. And we hear, you know, a lot of times, you know, we've done shows for how many, eight, nine years. And mm-hmm. we have people who will, will think about it every year and they come back mm-hmm. and they come back and they want them and they want them. When they finally get them, they say, ah, oh, I should have bought them when I first, you know. Yeah. It's not about not being able to see clearly because I can still see. Like, that's not a problem. And I can see with my reading glasses and my reading glasses aren't that strong. It's that you just get the precision 
of being able to see like you know that scant quarter inch that people talk about or just moving it over you can do that with these glasses yeah. um, in a, a way good. that isn't possible when you're a regular human yeah no it's a, it's a, it, everyone will say we get at, at, at shows in particular when we're face to face with with potential customers they'll say oh i see fine and i yeah. say i know you think you're bad your eyes are bad i'm just saying you can you can see so much better and when you you, you mentioned you alluded earlier to just kind of being in your own world yeah what it does yes you can see but you're not going to have to do this and you're not going to have to lean in and your back your neck you know those little things over time make a big difference a lot of people aren't able to you know they yes they can see but they're very uncomfortable while doing it so they're yeah. they're, yeah. They're, con they're constantly aware of the physical strains you know yeah. that they're going that kind of goes away with you um, the one thing I had to get used to was um, when you put them on, your hands look really big. And my yeah. brain was kind of freaking out about, like, why are my hands so big? Yeah. <laughs> so it took well, just a few minutes, but it was a funny moment of, like, yeah. I have hands the size of Shrek. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then it was like, but it was just a brain thing because yeah. my brain was confused as to why my hands were so big. But it, it, it went away really quickly, but it did make me well, laugh. Yeah. And, and a lot of times people think that they're leaning in closer than they are, too. They think that they're really close or they're holding something really close. And they realize, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm upright. I'm yeah. not hunched over. It's really interesting. Now, can you put the glasses on? I know it's audio, so we'll explain it. Um, but can you show us exactly like where they're supposed to be and sort of where where the work should be that you're working with, so that we have yeah. a sense of what that how that works? Yeah, and 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 on our homepage at craftoptics.com, if you scroll down to there's the bottom, there's a video, right? Video, and it's it's actually yeah. it's me telling you exactly the same thing, but okay. showing you. Okay. And, so you'll you'll see that's really helpful, um, and I'm actually going to break that up into some smaller chunks. But when you're so when you're wearing a couple of things to, to remember is you want to wear them. These these don't you don't slide these down on your nose like readers like some people do. Yeah. All the way up because you want the telescopes to be really close to your eyes. So the closer the telescopes are to your eyes, the wider the field is that you see. Uh huh. So it's like a keyhole effect. You know, when your eyes right up into the keyhole, you see. Got it. Okay, so it's that kind of effect. Yeah. And then when you're when you're working, you can see so, I'm, so I can see you know here's about you're you're gonna want to be it, uh, you know about 14 inches away from from what you're working on. Yeah. And so I see this you know perfectly, and I'm a, that's about exactly where I am. And then yeah. you can also get you get used to seeing above. Yeah. One of the reasons is all the way up is that you can see you around can. the frame right. is very specifically designed. We get this question a lot: Why can't I clip these onto my own glasses? Yeah. Well, look at your glasses. Everyone's glasses Small. are different. Right. So you can't, it, it's just not designed. This is designed to give you plenty of space above the telescope. Yeah. Sense. It's remarkable. Right. Yeah. And it's perfect. I mean, I, you can, I can actually, I can pick up, you know, no, I can write notes. I can do all kinds of stuff without having to look through the telescope. So yeah. one of the things that we tell people too is don't search around your area, your, your work area through the telescopes. Glance above and, yeah. you know, get away with it and then just, and then right. hit the spot and move. You know, and it's easy to flip it back up and up and down. I did that yesterday yeah. too. So yeah. you'll find most people will do this. Most people will just almost leave them down, and then yeah. they'll just they'll, they'll glance above to grab what they need, and then yeah. they'll tilt back up and then work that it's way. So awesome. Then, drop them down around their neck when they're done. Very cool. Now tell me a little bit about um, the intellectual property. Like, how do you protect the sort of what sort of what role does intellectual property play in the company and in the design? It's uh, so the, the 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 patented part that we have is the optics. That's really the that's in in this world the optics are, are are everything. So you can, and you'll see you know now in the dental market there are probably 13, 14 different companies that sell in that market, and they're pretty similar. Um, they, they all have they have patented certain elements of their product. Optically, there's not a huge difference, but where, where, where this makes a big difference for us is that we've patented the design of this, which is molded lenses, which means that they're a lot lighter weight, they're about 40% lighter than a similar device in the dental world. Yeah, they're and, not heavy. I mean, the, you would right. think they would be heavy, but they're not. So tell me, That's like... That's a big issue. They look heavier than they are. Yeah. And so the, the people always are very are surprised when they when they, they come to us, they're like, oh, I never want to wear those because they're too heavy. And then when they yeah. hold them in their hand, they're like, oh, that's... There's well, and it's problems. interesting because like where you hold, where you wear them on your 
face and plus the little thing to keep them on your like yeah. um, I wore them for a really long time yesterday like to much to my the horror of my kid like we were going everywhere um, and they didn't feel heavy like that's part that's of why I was sort of trying to figure out like can you wear these for a long time if you were sewing and yeah that's not a problem it doesn't uh, yeah. it doesn't yeah. feel overwhelming you know well and that's why you need to wear them all the way up that's yeah. really important it balances it better and yeah. also the pad adjustment is really important too so that adjust that the nose pad is kind of a sort of a saddle shape, so yeah. it, it's designed to hang on your nose and not sit on two points. And if it is sitting on two points, it will feel heavier. So you just need to widen that a little bit. Okay. We've yeah, done. No. We've had people in, at shows, and for example, try on one pair and say, "Oh, these are heavy," and then I'll give them another pair. It's the exact same weight, but the nose pads adjusted a little differently, and they go, "Oh, these are much lighter." Interesting. Well, it's a nose pad. It's a, little, it's a little, it's an adjustment more than the weight of the device itself. Now, with the original dentist ones, you had patents on it and the company, and that's what you sold was the technology and probably the name and the trademark of the goodwill of a company. That's what you were selling. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I then, mean, the patents, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the patents are obviously important, but, uh, well, as you know, people yeah. copy those things and, and, you know, there were instances of that in the dental world, and, and I, you know, I don't, I've been away from it for quite a while, but that was that was going on. Interesting. And so now, do you have active patents on these glasses as well? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yep. Uh, how would I find? Like, would they be under your name or under Craft Optics? Uh, yes. So it's on the optical design. Uh huh. Um, in this case, um, what I think is more important, it's important. Because it's that molding a lens is, is considerably more difficult than cutting optical glass. It's a, yeah. It's a harder. And it took us a couple of years to get it done properly. Um, but uh, the, the branding of the product and what we learned in the dental world, too, is that really the branding, the customer service, the all those things that you, you hear people talk about, that really... Uh, before people were even talking a lot about branding, that we realized that was a, a pretty key element. You know, hugely it was, important, right? It was product, yeah, it yeah. Was a product designed by a dentist. These were specs designed by someone who does this every day and knows it. Right. And and and, and, and we're in every magazine. We're at every show. We're showing yeah. it. It's hard work. We're showing people it's hard work. It's a lot yeah, to be. Lot. This is a lot. So yeah. So let me see if I can recap what you're saying. So the patents are important because industry. Like that's the property right that gives you the sort of um, the territory of hey this is mine or if you want a license, but but the enforcement of patents is very expensive and it sometimes you do it sometimes you don't. But for the consumer and sort of your base, the trademark is what really matters because they're going to go, I want Craft Optics because I know they're the good ones, um, yeah. and it's building up the brand and the brand recognition um, yeah. for that. In yeah. optics, it's not going to. It's not like a drug patent where they're, where it's going to keep someone, you know, another company completely out of the market. It's someone can come up with a magnifier, you know, in our world. Yeah. And, but it's you know, we we've got. I'll tell you the. the I'd say the experience and the the knowledge that we've gained over the. Now this is a we're entering our tenth year of doing this, which is amazing. Um, it, it is. Is you started not, it around two thousand eight. Yeah, we actually started. We, we we incorporated in 2009, so next year is our 10th anniversary. Amazing. So, yeah, spring of 2009. We started selling directly. We we did some. Um, we sold through uh, optical shops and um, a, a distributor the first year and a half, and then we realized it wasn't. Uh, we really wanted to sell that way. Yeah. <laughs> a lot easier, yeah. But, Realized as we did in dentistry that really the hand, the, the face-to-face, you know, communication was right. more important. So, do you feel like shows are the primary space that you? Is it word of mouth? Is it shows? You do also a lot. You said advertising in magazines, but sort of where's the focus of the business in terms of getting new customers? Well, it's shifted a lot. Uh, it's shifted dramatically in the last three years. It's it, it's it's amazing the difference. I mean, we have. Uh, several years ago, we did in, uh, something like thirty something shows a year. So that was our primary driver of sales was was a show, mm-hmm. and that's in jewelry and beadwork and sewing and quilting and you know it's a lot. 
miniatures and all kinds of stuff. And we've, in fact, we just went over the schedule for next year. We're, we're doing about, I think maybe 15, 16, something next year. And I, we did about, I think 17 this year. So that's, uh, that's a major shift. And where that has picked up is online, yeah. which, um, you know, that slack, I mean, I was concerned this year having cut about half of our shows. A lot of the shit, they're very expensive to do. They're and very expensive and exhausting. You know, but, yeah, like, I can't you, believe how exhausting they are. We yeah, did it for our first booth. It was really traumatic. Yeah, you imagine <laughs> so I was there at the first, I was there at market and festivals. Me so too, me time. too. We were there the whole time yeah. and it was exhausting. I mean, I don't know how people do it. I mean, I barely survived it. It was so oh, much. It's just yeah. so much. And every, every visitor to our booth needs a demonstration and a discussion. It's not like I can lay them out on a table right. or hang up on a wall and have someone select the one they want and then right. just pay for it. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, I was talking about what we've learned and what some of the value is of what we've learned. And that is that we know when someone said, like you got, when you spoke to Lynn in our yeah. office about the prescription and about, you know, we walk people through that stuff because it's confusing and it's, right. you know, we have to provide guidance. It's not yeah. just something. So it's, that's why it's part of why it's so exhausting and also very valuable because we learn a lot. Every show yeah. we go to, that is why I like to do it. You know, a number yeah. of them. Are, um, but yeah. Well, I loved at your booth that you had the cross stitch there so you could actually oh, yeah. sew. That was sure. so brilliant because like sure. the moment you're just like, wow, it's just, um, yeah, it just makes a huge difference to have the yeah. demo of the cross stitch. Yeah. 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 It's, a, it's a big deal. And so that's the, the shows where, you know, we're a major part of our business but it also is a major expense and so if you had a couple of shows that were duds you know that that hurts so for you what's a good show like how many sales makes a good show for you uh well i want to give away what we sell at shows. no but i'm i guess i'm just saying that like we could quite figure out how do, like i guess i imagine okay let me put it a different way mm-hmm. i imagine it's both sales and exposure that's going to lead to future sales. So it isn't just people yeah. buying stuff there. Right. It's the interaction because people may take time to think about it. There's just, it's more than just like, I want four of those kind of thing, right? It's not right. like ordering a cheeseburger. It's more right. significant than that. Right. In fact, so I always, I always tell our reps too, that when we're at a show, we're selling for this show. We want yeah. to come out ahead yeah. on this show. But we're also selling, you know, for next year's show and the show after that, yeah. you know, two years rows because that's what it, now. It, it has been that some people are waiting two or three years before they buy, um, but, but they do eventually. And what's so it's interesting. We can go to a show that's everyone else is complaining about, and we do really well because it's people that we've already sold to several years in the past, and they come and they this is the show they're ordering. Yeah. So um, that's interesting. So, yeah, do you so, feel like the word of mouth, like once one person buys it, they're telling their other, like, because they're, yeah. I imagine you don't get a ton of repeat customers per se, but you get kind of telephone, kind of like I, I use it, then somebody else uses it, kind of, is that part correct. of the marketing strategy as well? Correct. Someone uses them at their guild meeting and then another, oh, let me try those. Oh, those are cool. I'll, you know, you like them? Yeah. So you get that yeah. kind of. Uh, that kind of interaction. So that's, that's accelerating the word of mouth part. And so it's, you know, you have to um, look, we do a, we offer a money back guarantee. Yeah. You put your prescription in. So yeah. we don't push something on anybody who isn't, you know, yeah. who be thrilled with it or who we don't think we've guided properly to, to, you know, to enjoy them. If, if someone doesn't like it, it that we eat it. Yeah. So, uh, we are not pushy in that regard. We're no, uh, you're not. I mean, and you're very kind of like you let people like really explore, and you really want. It's like a public service in some way. Like you're like you can see better. This is going to be more fun, and we're just here to show you this stuff. You're not like yeah. aggressive. You kind of no. let the product speak for itself in some way by having people experience it. Yeah, and that and what it, it, we you're right we let it, it and we learned that in dentistry too. So we used to have in the dental world we'd have these fake dental heads with you know various tooth problems uh-huh. in them and uh, that were used in dental schools and we had those in our booth and so a, a dentist could sit down put the glasses on and look in the mouth and, and and we'd hand them instruments and they could sit there and and almost they could imagine themselves in their office actually working on a patient That's really cool you know that frame of mind yeah then then they can then it just then we don't have to say anything but then it's like okay yeah that's you know, exactly what happened with the cross stitch you're like okay well 
This is yeah. just better, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. It's, there's um, not a lot of... All right. So you said that you – I cut you off, and I'm really sorry. I just got enthusiastic. Sure. So you said that you're not doing as many shows. You've cut, cut down because yeah. it's shifted to online. So tell me more about sort of what's happening you with your company. You told me three or four years ago that a you know, majority of our sales would be coming from uh, uh, online or over the phone. I would have been very – surprised however mm-hmm. you know it's not a cheap item so I, it's it's an investment and so i thought well uh it'll have to we'll have to see how that works yeah uh, and so we've been testing over the last we it's a constant you know online sales and online marketing is a, is a constant test and i think we went through a phase a couple of years ago that was a little too uh promotiony i think a little too uh we got away from a little bit away from our um, uh, advisory, you know, guide. Yeah, it's of. funny because online is very much about the authentic voice, and so yeah. they people don't want salesy stuff. They want like real people using it in a real way, and right. that that it's like humans talking to humans. It seems like from right. what we're seeing. Right. Um, no, it's it's true, and it's true. And, you know, it's I think it's it's more true for an expensive, you know. Expensive, but a, you know, a cost-effective. Uh, well, this is what I say: it's a cost-effective item for the wonderful value it provides. And that's yeah. uh, when people come to the booth and say, "Well, how expensive are?" It? But it is an investment, but it's a one-time investment. So once you get them, if your eyes change over time, you just change the lenses in the frame. You don't change. You don't. You don't have to buy a whole new set. Yeah. So it's a one-time thing that'll last you for your life if you take care of it. So, um, you know, it's it's it, it requires. Uh, Patience and trust, and um, and you know, real discussion, not just like sale now, on sale now. Now, that being said, there are certain times of the year, like Black Friday and Cyber Monday, and that kind of stuff. Where this in the past couple of weeks, where people who know us and they're on our list already, they understand what we are. When we show them, you know, that's that's the time when we can say, "Hey, yeah. not deal here, guys. Yeah. You know, this if you're thinking about it. This is the time." Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Well, yeah. um, I can't wait for people to try them and come to the um, the clubhouse and play. Um, cool. Where are you going to be in terms of um, quilting? So if people are listening and they want to try them, um, where will you be in the upcoming year? Well, let's see. I was here. Uh, we are going to be at Road to California. Oh, cool. Uh, we will be at the uh, Hampton, the Mid-Atlantic Quilt Festival in Hampton. Mm-hmm. We'll be at... Uh, Sewing and Citri Expo in Puyallup, and uh, Paducah. Paducah. Yep. Huge. And that's kind of our spring quilty lineup. We have some other gem. We'll be in Tucson for the gem and mineral show, too. Yeah, we do the- yeah that's a big show. We used to live yeah. in Tucson. That's like a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's right. I forgot you. My folks live there. Yeah. So that's- yeah, yeah. Uh, we, uh, my kid was born there. We did. I did grad school. Part of my grad school was there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, we're yeah, right we're... In, that, in that old holodome area. Uh, it's 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 called the holodome, even though it doesn't exist anymore. It's just a couple uh-huh. of giant tents. But it's a not talk about exhausting shows. This is not. I think it's nine straight days. Oh my gosh! Thank you. <laughs> all right. So, do you have strategy? Because I think we did this. Did I think I did it all wrong? First of all, we had to prepare, prepare, prepare. So we were too exhausted by the time we got there for yeah. market. But like, what's your strategy for like getting through? This, the, these shows are exhausting. There's so many people oh. coming at you. There's all this, the the sensory overload. There's just a lot. Well, it was funny because when we saw you, I, I remember thinking to myself, she's going to burn out because you're going to get exhausted. Totally. <laughs> I totally did. I got <laughs> benched by my yeah, team like two days for two days. Booth, that's exhausting. That so, I mean, it's hard just to show up and open. I mean, we have, you know, we've done enough of these. We yeah. have it really down to a science where everything fits of course, having optics too, they're not big. So, you, yeah. can, you know, in the case of, you know, a, a dozen, that, that's yeah. all we need to, to do the demos. But everything, our entire booth, including the backdrop and all the lights, fits in one rolling shipping case. That is so smart. We got to gotta do that. And we, yeah, you have to you have to figure out the right way to do that and, and, and do it. And then at the end of the night, what's nice is we can throw anything that's valuable back into that case. It yeah. locks. Very clever. And, and so, and then at the end, we put a label, throw everything back in it, throw a label on it, and it's picked up and shipped And does back. it just, like, stay in the ship shipping container for the next show? Do you just have, like, a – or do you unpack when you get home? 
We do unpack some of it, uh, and we always take the glasses out, clean them, adjust them, fix everything up, make sure everything's you know ready to go. So and make sure, test all the lights, make sure nothing was broken a lot, you know, in shipping and all that kind of stuff. So then we we keep we we usually have we have some shelving here that where we keep all the stuff for the show. So it's pretty straightforward. Not you know we've done it enough that yeah, you do it a lot. You do it yeah. a lot many mm-hmm. times a year. Now, how are the shows different? How are quilters different than the other shows you go to? Are we all the same as crafters, or do you see a difference in sort of the different spaces you play in? Uh, I see a difference, and it's uh, I would say that quilters are um, tend to when they when they see our product, they know it's they know it right away. They don't really need a lot of convincing. Yeah, I'm not sure why that is, but it, it seems they, they're. They're earlier adopters than I was expecting. Interesting. Yeah, Interesting. And, and so people, as soon as they see it, because clearly there's some vision challenge going on, and there's there or one aspect of what they do is well. Is, I mean, the problem is that like it's precise work, and we're like in our either we're exhausted because we're in our 30s with kids, or 20s and 30s with kids, and we're exhausted, or we're a little bit older. So, but it's all this little precise stuff. So right. it's it's ridiculous. So we're working at night, so yeah. we are challenged by our environment or our own bodies, yeah. um, and also we like tool. We like we like play things. Like we're we're used to buying equipment and other things. Like well, and that's, you, know. you know, and it's funny that you say used to buying equipment because you know people will look at craft optics and go, oh well, I just I don't need another pair of glasses, and they, and they can't get it out of their head that it's a that what it is is it's a vision. It's another piece of, it's a vision equipment. Mm-hmm. You know, vision right. equipment. It's another set of glasses. If they get out of that mode of, you know, I'm, I've got to buy another set of glasses. Right. They just buy the glasses. Yeah, they're not glasses. They're equipment. Yeah. Right. They're it's, like yeah. the AccuQuilt yeah. or your, or your long it. arm or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's yeah. really important. In, um, I would say in beading and jewelry, I think there's, there's been a, uh, uh, they have, uh, worked closer so a jeweler's bench is a little more if you look on our site you'll see pictures of people working at jeweler's benches yeah and, they're and so they're used to being a little bit closer and they're used to wearing like a, a, a visor kind of thing and so they'll sit right on top of it and they'll hunch over like this you That's know really and interesting just, and they've done it that way forever so actually for them they have a hard time a harder time getting used to sitting back a little bit interesting because it's changing their nature of work um, by putting the glasses a little, on a little bit, but then they're over time. So very much like what we saw in dentistry was with, with my father is they start to get these terrible back trouble, uh, troubles. And so they re- recognize that they got to do something or they're not going to be able to right. do anymore. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Now was your dad, I don't know if your dad's still alive, but was he yeah. around for the shift to crafts? Well, he and I are partners in this company. Oh, so. fabulous. Yes. So, so he's he, been part of it. So what did he think yeah. about moving from dentistry to crafting? Oh, he loves this. Yeah. I mean, he's not, he's, not as, he's not actively involved in running the company, but he and I are partners. And That's so great. He the benefit of, you know, he's in, he's in Tucson. So he has the benefit of, um, of seeing it from a bit of a distance, which is, I think, really, it's valuable to me because, you know, when I come into the office, it's... Right, you're like yeah. on the right. You're like the trees, and he's more the forest guy. Yeah, doing, doing, doing. Yeah. yeah, and so I have to sit back sometimes. Sometimes I just I'll go to a coffee shop and just sit for a couple hours and do some thinking and talk to him. We talk about that stuff, and I can. It's nice to have him to you know, bounce things off. Yeah. So, I've been yeah. it to, so what yeah. is it? The other thing that I see in quilting, and and it may be true across like jewelry and others, but having sort of focused on quilting for this last year, is how many are family based businesses. That um, and you've got that as well, and I'm wondering, sort of, how has that been? Are there challenges? Sort of, do you see it as well that that a lot of this industry is, even if the even as people grow into big companies, you think about Superior Threads and other ones, they're still family based. They start as family based companies, and I'm I'm really curious about that part of it. Well, I, I've seen this before. So I saw this in the dental world. It was very, what I'm seeing now and what I'm, we're going through with our company now is, I mean, I'm telling you, other than the internet, which is a major change and a major mm-hmm. difference, uh, because we had, we didn't have that in the dental world back then. We advertised in magazines and that was it. Yeah. But uh, 
the, the, the makeup of the companies was very similar. It was, it was smaller. Each dental equipment manufacturer was a family company. And this family company made these things. And this family company made these things. And this family company made oroscopic. It's amazing, right? Yeah. But what happened was, and this is, and we kind of saw this coming is some of the bigger companies then said, Hey, you know, we already have sales reps who are calling on all these dentists. We ought to, you know, we need to add more products to their bag. Let's, let's acquire this company. Let's yeah. acquire that company. And all yeah. of a sudden the bigger companies started buying up uh, a lot of the stuff. Yeah. Do you so think that's happening that was, with quilting? Do you think that will happen with quilting? I think it will happen. I don't think yeah. it's, I don't know if it's how much, to what extent it's happening now, but it, it's coming because this is exactly, it's, I see it. I saw it happen. Now, yeah. our old company, yeah. Oroscopic, is owned by a public company. It's now part of a public group. That's so it's sold twice since we sold it. Wow. Yeah. That's so really it's, that, it's kind of the nature of what's going on. So I would imagine that's yeah. probably coming. Because I was really surprised that they are so much family companies and small companies. And even just the whole shop structure is independent small comp- small shops um, that we haven't gotten to a more monolithic, bigger Thing. I mean, you've got bigger companies, right? We've got some big companies in quilting, but yeah. it still surprised me um, that it wasn't. Um, so, yeah, you think it's coming. Right. Well, I yeah. think so. The reason I think that's coming is because some of the people owning these companies are getting older. And yeah. so they're going to, if they don't have family to take over their business, it's they're going to sell them to somebody. I think it's that's really interesting. It's kind of a wave that I think is coming. That ha- That's what happened in, in the dental world. And I, and, and, and unfortunately, I see that with quilt shops closing because they just people want to retire and they're not even they're trying to sell them or and they can't sell them and they, right. they, close. they just close them yeah and that people, kind of oh, that shop. turnover is kind of interesting and then yeah. also we see it with the uh the guilds getting older and i think what's interesting about it is that like i just interviewed marianne fawns and she was talking about like she were they were young right when so when they were creating this sewing revolution they were in their 20s and 30s um, and so this idea that like it's an older craft is not something that's true like it right. just happens that right now it is but that doesn't necessarily mean that it always has been so i think that's interesting too you know a lot of the modern there are a lot of modern quilting guilds that have younger uh, you know, a, a local one here in town it has a mix. It's a, yeah. it's a yeah. you know, anywhere from in you know, thirty low thirties to seventies. Right, and, and then there's a sort of movement of sort of figuring out how do you uh, attract sort of the young kids, the the teens, the the middle schoolers, and yeah. others to get them interested and excited um, when they're younger. Um, and so there's a lot of conversations about that right now too, whether that's fashion or or cosplay or quilting itself. But sort of how do you in, inject it with youth um, well, because you know all the big companies, the Berninas and the you know the big the, the major companies have to have a younger crowd. They're investing. I'm oh, sure. Have, totally yeah. okay. So my kid came. So she, my kid is, um, she's 15. She's kind of a non-binary hipster kid, you know, with half shaved head and all that. And so she was working. In, so she came for the weekend to work in the booth because you know I make her do. She was very sweet. She came in it, and so, but. It was weird because, like, one group was like, hey, can you come talk to us and show us what you like? And then, like, another group was like, hey, can you come? And it was like – and then we um, we purchased a, a embroidery machine, and they were going crazy for, like, the fact that we were, like, purchasing um, – you know, they gave us a discount for it because we're going to be using it for her, her um, art school. Um, but – it was really interesting to watch sort of they all sort of wanted to be around to sort of like it's youth. It's like it's that artsy youth person here. Um, but it was really weird to watch because it, it was like one after the other um, once we were out walking around. It was for weird. Sure. Yeah. yeah. They need more yeah. youth. Like it's a cool place for youth if you want to be yeah. They cool. want to get them there and, and, and have more events for I think that I think people are starting to recognize that. And I think they already have. Yeah. Um, otherwise, you know, it's – it's, you know, it's going to be a, a real yeah. problem for people. But, you know, we went through this, it, 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 you know, it's not like we're old, but I see, I, I remember in the, you know, in the eighties, the baby boomers were hitting their forties. Yeah. Okay? That is they and that was when they, the, around in between 40 and 50, that's when you start to need reading glasses. Right. That's when your vision starts that's to right. go a little bit. And so that's, we kind of hit that that right of course and my dad was you know at that uh, age as well so th- those kinds of things are you know hit them the vision stuff hit them now 
Gen X is hitting their 40s. Totally. That's right. So it's another, so it's right. another wave. Right. It, totally. A new, whole new wave of like, that's just yeah. annoying that I can't see like yeah. a 12 year old anymore. Yeah. So it's yes. me. Like, I was in the last year of the baby boomers. And so, and then the next wave is hitting the same. So now it's like yeah. the same thing again um, it, it, coming through. So that group is more, you know, uh, apt to, I think, get into quilting and get, you know. Yeah. So interesting, isn't it? The other thing we saw, which is really interesting, was that we were right across the, the, the um, like our booth was right next to the one where they teach you how to sew, like their little projects. Yeah. And the amount of kids that were there, and then we gave, because we, we had Mardi Gras themes, so we gave away free toys to oh. anybody. They had to show that they were a kid. Like we asked them, are you a kid? They were usually like eight. And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, okay, well, you get a free toy. Because, um, you know, we have the Mardi Gras throws. Um, yeah. But I also thought that it was interesting and that they needed more for the kids. Because they were really enthusiastic and excited, um, but the show isn't really geared towards them. So I'm wondering if that there's more way to have special, more special spaces for the kids. Because I think that they they ate it up. They stayed for a really long time. They you know they weren't just there for five minutes. They were like doing serious projects. So yeah. I think there's some something there as well to sort of cater to that, you know, eight to twelve year olds that are yeah. really. They have them doing something with their hands instead of being on a screen, and it's you know, and having them engage that long. Yeah. Yeah. So I th- I'm sure you know, we're not yet doing that. It's not really our area. Cause no, we, no, no. I was just that was just uh, another area that I thought was really it's interesting important for the industry as a whole. I yeah. Mean, if, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, I just adore you in every way, and I hope that um, my enthusiasm helps you. <laughs> whatever way possible because um i don't really feel this way about most products i get we get a lot of you know products sent to us right now and then most of the time we just you know we talk about them and we experience them because it's important to experience them because you don't really understand them until you actually have them in your hands and are using them but your stuff these are amazing they're you're changing people's lives in huge ways and uh and making the um making quilting more fun and it should be all about being fun and so i just think you're incredible and amazing, okay. and um, I'm super excited that um, we get to play with these, and and that we keep seeing you and going on more adventure. It'd be really great. Sure. sure, and you make sure you you know if you have any questions along the way, just call, email, whatever. You Fabulous. Know. Well, we're gonna start um, doing. Uh, this is the last week of school, so we're very excited about that. Yeah, um, okay. So quilting begins uh, on Saturday. Um, for real, till August. I mean, till uh, January eighteenth. No more school for a while. Oh wow, that's a good break. I know, right? That's a lot. Law professor, it's like a thing. So nice. um, no grading to do either. So, <laughs> um, so yeah. So we're gonna do more videos and have people over and just experience it. And um, I'm super psyched. So I think this will be really fun. I know people are excited to come over and and use them on all kinds of things: hand quilting, long arm. Sure. sewing embroidery so they can sort of experience it in its natural habitat so yeah absolutely and if you and even if you're you know if, if you if you have you know this setup the zoom setup yeah. while they're there you want me to you know if there's a time where people are going to be in and you yeah. want me to do a little you know, oh video. fabulous yeah that sounds good we'll do that that sounds great i love it all right well let's do that um okay. awesome well is there um you don't need to review this before we post it is that right uh that's yeah we that's didn't fine. talk about anything wild or that yeah. we need to Okay, cool. Nope, nope, awesome. Um, I do awesome. want to tell you one thing, though, that I forgot yeah. to tell you. Yeah. And it's, you know, you don't have to obviously include this in, but yeah. it's a story from the show. Two, two interesting stories from the show that I wrote that I wanted to mention. Yeah. About changing lives. So one, and this is like, you know, to me, this is the best part of what we do when this happens. So there was a woman who does uh, some unbelievable needlepoint. And she uh, started getting macular degeneration. And so she... she she makes these things. I'm telling you, they look like photos. They're uh-huh. and they're huge. Uh-huh. She um, came to the booth with her daughter, and she was struggling. She's kind of, she was worried she was going to have to quit doing it, which is like her life. It, it is her life. Yeah. And she put them on, in the uh, and brought out some uh, that she was working on, and she could see it, and she started crying. I was like, oh my god, it was so it was so cool. She was like, it was it was just like this relief that. She's got something. She can still do this stuff. She yeah. was, it was worrying her so much. Yeah. Now, I don't know how long that's going to last. You know, it's, it depends on her. Everyone's a little bit different with, with that. Um, yeah, but that was that happened in the booth. That's uh, really at, cool. That's huge. 
That's and so then huge. another, which is, which is, this, there were two of these at the show. So this was a really different one. This was a woman from Australia came in and her son who was, I think 12 had, uh, and I'm, I'm forgetting the name of, um, of what he has, but his eyes, they, they shake back and forth. I can actually get the name. Yeah. Hey Lynn, what's the name of that, um, of, of this, the, um, I issue that they, that little boy had in, in uh, from Australia, whose eyes were shaking. They had to hold everything really, really close. Nystagmus. What is it? Nystagmus. It's called nystagmus. And so he had to see, like to look, to look at his phone, for example. Yeah. He go. He'd have to go like this. So he's yeah. looking close to see. And she thought, you know, I wonder if, um, I wonder if these glasses might help him. And he wasn't at the show. Like she, so right. she came back and uh-huh. brought him in. Uh huh. Down and he put them on. So he, he puts them on and he and he and he starts looking at his phone like this. He's wow, like, huge, right? He was, he was he he was seeing just great. I mean, it was like that's amazing. Was, so he's that's amazing. in he the school and everything. Like he has to read and see. So that was those are two things that happened at that show. Do you time. have others that are like cuz I think about my grandfather who passed away in the 80s, but like he he was a massive reader. He was like one of those like, you know, his whole life was about yeah. like being an intellectual and he when the eye doctor was like, I don't even know how he can see at this point. Like like then they got him a reading machine. It was amazing, but it seems like these yeah. would also be great for that as well. Do you see crossover with people that are struggling with like what yeah. the stories you're telling? <laughs> Yeah, we get calls, and, and always at shows, we'll have somebody who's got, uh, you know, uh, early stages of macular degeneration. They're worried about, like like this, uh, the needle point, they're worried about not being able to do their craft. Yeah. Um, they can still do it, but they're not, it's just not as fun. And so I they kind of, yeah. So uh, that area where someone's in that range is really ideal for what we do. Interesting. So we can be really helpful. If it's too far along, then it's not. I mean, it, and it's yeah. hard to say. There, we even have a blog post about this. So if someone's able to still function, if they're still doing some sewing, but they've had to stop doing the, yeah. you know, the, the whatever now, things, then we can be really helpful. Now, with your background, what is your, I know we're supposed to end, but what is your background? Do you have, like, you, your whole world is eyes. Like, did you, like, how did you get into, like, the eye world? <laughs> oh, my background is a, MB, a master of science in business and real estate investment analysis. So isn't it an- <laughs> Very good. That's <laughs> very. Uh, and that was that was my, how my career started off. And when um, I was in Philadelphia working with an investment group, and then in Milwaukee working with, which is now U.S. Bank, is first star bank at the time, uh, overseeing all the corporate real estate stuff. So this has, I just grew up with it. It has nothing to do with my how interesting official training. I grew up with it, seeing it from the time I was seventeen at the yeah. very first that we ever did in the dental world. Um, to to working with you know our optical engineers and optometrists and ophthalmologists and learning yeah. over the if I had to start over again yeah I would I would go into the you know I would be an ophthalmologist and optometrist I like both I like yeah. both the you know the the, the 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 science behind it and also the actual the the um, the devices that help people and, and a lot of times yeah. they're not they, they kind of disconnect the ophthalmologist is not necessarily up to speed on devices for somebody they're okay with the diagnosing and the surgeries and all the other but the the actual physical device that an optometrist would have it's they're just not always together yeah the solution is and so i i would love to be back in that and that's that's not my background it's just you know 30 plus years of that's amazing that's so amazing right like what happens in the path we take we there are all of our journeys are kind of (laughs) strange and interesting winding roads of weirdness yeah. so yeah i went in real estate and now you'll see me at I, you know you'll see me at quilt shows <laughs> awesome <laughs> <laughs> well this is so awesome thank you so much again i'm so psyched and again we're, we'll we'll tag you on anything that we're doing in terms of posts so you can know what's going on and um, as i said people are going to start hanging out and using them and all that so i'm super psyched i monitor i'll I'll, you know i keep an eye i have like alerts and stuff too so if someone asks questions i usually jump on it awesome fabulous i love it well thanks again i hope you have a great day um and i will keep you posted on all the quilting and hand work i'm going to be doing thanks to uh this great experiment um they're amazing they really are and uh you are too and the story is just such a great story so thank you um it's really great awesome all right take care 
Bye. You too. Bye-bye. So you've been listening to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School. And I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gard. If you like this podcast, keep listening. Also, we have a Facebook group. Come join us. We talk about a lot of things. We also have an Instagram account. And of course, most importantly, I really hope you get a chance to quilt today.